Hello everyone and welcome to the next uh, to the next lecture of the Macroeconomics 3 course. Um, to start with some clarifications. First of all, obviously I know that tomorrow, that is the 23rd of March, there should be no uh, no course. However, I decided that it's maybe better to have half of the lecture uh, posted today and half of the of the lecture number four posted next week from two reasons for two reasons. First of all, I guess it gives you a bit more time to uh, familiarize with with those things that are quite important in this course and uh, um, to get familiar with the with the model in in in, in principle. Uh, secondly, it's it's good from my own perspective because I will have less work next week, and you know it's 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 kind of kind of good. But anyway, so today uh, we have uh, lecture four, four point one in fact. So the first part of the lecture four, the medium run in an open economy. Um, so today the goal will be, let me just just click this uh, here. The goal will be today to uh, to compare the, the aggregated demand aggregated supply model with this uh, which one which which is from the um, uh, from the old version of the textbook and it's it's the main model that we are going to focus on in this course with the ISLM and PC model uh, that that comes from the new version of the textbook so i will give you the the transition from one model to the other something which i i, I hoped to do before but i'm i'm pretty sure we didn't have enough time to 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 explain it in, in a way that I wanted to, to explain it. Therefore, let's let's do it properly so that hopefully everyone is on the same page. And the second thing would be policy shocks in closed ADAS models. So something which you, which you could have analyzed previously. Uh, so the medium run model and the policy experiments in the medium run model um, in the closed economy. Okay. And the next week will be the open economy medium run model plus uh, some, some storytelling, those points that are listed here uh, below, which are not that much theoretically oriented. We do theory today. Next week we do, we do something a bit more, um, yeah, a, a bit more qualitative, let's say, okay? One more thing, as you, as you hopefully noticed, uh, my YouTuber's career is, is really on a, on, a, on an increase, on a, on a rise, I, I managed even to, um, to to have the camera working. So um, yeah, so hopefully it will improve our cooperation in the in the coming weeks. As it is rather obvious that unfortunately the situation which we have right now will will last for a bit longer than that people initially expected. Um, yeah, in terms of macroeconomics, we will have also some occasion to talk about. Uh, talk about how to get rid of this this situation. What what are the the policies that that can be implemented here? And I hope we will have some time to to talk about uh, what is happening at the macroeconomic level right now. That is why it's it's good for you to to uh, simply look at the media and look what's happening out there. What different countries are implementing? What type of policies? Monetary policies? Fiscal policies? What are the risks for the global economy caused by the by the coronavirus crisis? And this is something we'll be discussing in the in the coming uh, in the coming lectures. So hopefully, um, this theoretical background which we'll study today, plus the open economy context, plus the crisis that we talked about last week. All of this will give us a good perspective on how to deal with the crisis right now and what should be done uh, and what are the, the, the main risks. Okay, this was an off top. So um, let's go to the uh, let's go to the core of the of the today's uh, today's lecture uh, or or half lecture. Okay. So um, the medium run and uh, the medium run model. So we started, hopefully, a couple of weeks ago, as you remember, uh, we started with describing the, the medium run with uh, introducing the third market to our uh, ISLM model. So the ISLM model 
is the, our benchmark for the short term in which we have two markets. We have the goods market and we have the financial market. So now to this, we are adding the third market, which is a labor market. Or something which is, which is very abstract, but should represent a labor market. <clears throat> so in this market, we have three equations that describe the economy as simple as this. Equation number one, as you can see here on the slide, a nominal wage is a function of expected prices and a function of the unemployment rate, this is this u, and z, some other determinants that are outside of the model, but we know that they exist. For example, uh, the strength of the unions, okay, um, or uh, the, the, um, the law that is, that is in the country that is determining how the relations between employers and employees look like. Okay, so something totally exogenous, which we don't care in this model. So we have the nominal wage, which is increasing with the expected price level and decreasing with the unemployment rate due to this bargaining power of workers on the labor market. As you remember from the first lecture, we, we have already discussed this. We have then a second uh, equation, which is called the price setting equation, uh, which is, the let's say, the firm side of the economy. And here we have uh, that the price level in the economy Sorry, the price price level in the economy is a is a function of the nominal wages, which constitute the main cost for the for the firms to produce, times one plus mu, and this mu is simply the profit margin of firms. Okay, so firms have a fixed profit margin on on the cost that that they uh, that they apply, uh, that they have to in, uh, incur to to produce goods, and this is the price level in the economy. And there is a third um, identity that we that we have out there in this uh, free equation system, the identity that tells us what is the definition of the unemployment rate. And as you remember, this is simply the ratio of unemployed people to all the individuals that are in the in the economy. So all the individuals out there, and this using the assumption that output is a linear function of the number of working uh, working people, so number of workers. This gives us a very simple representation, the unemployment rate equal to 1 minus output over the TFP times the, um, TFP times the number of uh, individuals in the economy. The TFP will be normalized to 1, so you don't, don't have to care about this. Uh, we say nothing about uh, the structure of population, who is working and how many people are there in the population. This is also exogenous. What is important here in this equation is only the relation between unemployment rate and uh, the output, the, um, the value of, of, of GDP that is produced in the economy, okay? And you remember that with those three equations, which describe very broadly the labor market in a particular economy, we can uh, derive the so-called AS function, aggregated supply function, um, by uh, taking the second equation, putting instead of W, this right-hand side of the first equation, and then instead of u, we put the, the right-hand side of the third equation, and we arrive at this very simple expression, which tells us what's the relation between the price level in the economy as a function of three factors, uh, the expected price level, a profit margin, and the third one is the unemployment rate, here written in an explicit form that unemployment rate is equal to one minus something which is, which is depending on the output in the economy, okay? Fantastic. And then you remember uh, that in the, I don't know which, which lecture, I think lecture three, but I might be wrong. I think it was lecture three, that from this equation, we derived something uh, which is a function not of the price levels, but of price changes, that is inflation rate. So in fact, this equation AS and the equation AS star are totally equivalent and we proved this yeah and it was in lecture three as you can see here sorry uh, you also have a proof of this uh, transition from one equation to the other on page 172 in the new textbook so in the, the new version of the textbook okay but you remember that what we did here is we divided both sides by the uh, by the price level in the moment t minus one remember also that uh, Normally, in the medium term, we should index all the variables with the time subscript because we are now in medium run. So now time does matter. It's different than what we had in the short run because in the short run, time did not matter because everything was you know, happening instantly, like in the same 
uh, super fast, completely different. In the medium run, it's not the case. Now we have longer time period that takes from you know forming equilibrium and people realizing that if things are changing in the economy. Therefore, in all the equations that I will show you today, remember that implicitly there are time subscripts for all the variables, especially those endogenous variables like prices, output level, or the interest rate. Okay, There is implicitly a time subscript, and implicitly there should be a time subscript here as well. Okay, So the inflation rate in time t is a function of the expected level of inflation time t plus the margin, which is constant, exogenous, plus some other exogenous factor z minus uh, the unemployment rate times the um, a coefficient, which can be uh, estimated if you have data on inflation and unemployment. Okay, but the point was that uh, we have a very simple transition from one equation to the other by dividing the first equation with p t minus one, so the previous level of prices. Okay, then realizing that the inflation rate is one plus, um, uh, sorry, that the ratio of pr of prices in time t and t minus 1 is in fact 1 plus inflation rate in time t, and then realizing or using a very common um, mathematical um, identity or approximation that the logarithm of 1 plus something is almost equivalent to something, when this something is very close to zero, okay? And we use this to derive equation uh, as star starting from equation as, so there is a total equivalence between those two equations. And the third thing, or the last thing that we did in lecture three regarding the, the medium term um, was deriving the Phillips curve. And to do this, we simply um, expressed the natural level of unemployment as a function of those two exogenously given variables and the parameter alpha. Then we substituted for this mu plus z in the equation a s star. And then we, um, so that we got this part of the equation, okay? So the difference in the inflation rates was a negative function in difference of the current unemployment rate and uh, natural level of unemployment. And there is a negative relation between inflation and, uh, and unemployment rate. This is a standard classical Phillips curve, okay? And this is what you already uh, noticed or had uh, learned in the previous macro courses. The same thing regarding uh, the next step here, which which would be simply substituting uh, for the unemployment rates, simply realizing that the unemployment rate is this function of output, and just putting this equation out there. Now uh, the big difference here is that you don't you lose the negative sign here. Okay, if you always keep the natural level of of the of the variable here on the right hand side. Okay, so this is a big difference. So now we have a positive relation between inflation or the differential in the inflation and the output level, okay? Here we had a negative relation between differential inflation and the unemployment rate. So hopefully this is, this is clear. But this also gives you a very strong argument that what we are doing with the AS curve, with the price levels, is almost the same as what we would do if we assume the Phillips curve as our a point of reference as our way of measuring what's happening on the on the labor market. And today my goal is to show you exactly that this is equivalent. Okay? So that you are not confused or confused less. Okay? That's uh, uh, that those two approaches are uh, are different. They are not different. They are actually very very close to each other. All right, so now let's focus on those two approaches. So we have uh, the two things happening at the same time. So we will compare this AS approach, which is, let's say, the old, um, old textbook approach, which is the one that I will use during the lecture today and later on next week. And we compare this with the Phillips curve approach for, from the new textbook. Both of those approaches give us some relation between prices, the left-hand side, yeah, the price level or the price change, the inflation rate, and output on the right-hand side. All right, so this is the output gap, so the difference between the current output and the natural level of output. And here we have some artificial function of 
unemployment, and we know that unemployment is a function of output in our super simple economy. Okay? And both of those equations give you an increasing relation between prices and output. So now let's first focus on, on the aggregated supply uh, approach. So the, the one that is important for us for the next, uh, for the next uh, further analysis, let's say. So what happens when uh, output goes up in this labor market described by the, by the aggregated supply curve? To explain this in economic terms, so to give us an economic intuition, what's happening in the economy when the output goes up, let's go back to the first slide. And let's analyze how, the, how these three equations react to our, let's say, exogenous change in output. Okay? So if output goes up, the first thing that is, uh, that is happening is, of course, that the unemployment rate goes up. Uh, sorry, uh, goes down. Yeah? So if output goes up, so this right-hand side variable, if this goes up, the whole uh, right-hand side goes down. So unemployment rate goes down, of course. If there is more income in the economy, people are spending more so the demand is higher if the demand is higher the production should be higher so that the demand is fulfilled and if the production is higher more people more people have to be employed right so unemployment is going down so unemployment is going down so now what's happening with uh, with the labor market equilibrium when unemployment goes rate goes down we know that there is a negative relation between unemployment and the nominal wages so lower unemployment means that workers have now a higher higher bargaining power on the labor market so they can ask higher wages for the same work therefore um, the nominal wage will go up okay so we have a positive relation between output nominal wages and here you have a clear-cut uh, argument that there is a positive relation between nominal wages and prices so we have a positive relation between output and prices and this is exactly what we see in this in this aggregated supply curve Nothing more than this. Positive relation between output and prices. And the same is, in fact, depicted by the Phillips curve. There is a positive relation between the, the difference between the, the, the current and expected level of, of inflation and the output gap. The higher the output level, the higher the inflation of player pressure uh, due to the bargaining power of workers. This is exactly the same relation. Okay, But the, there are some fundamental um, okay, so let's let's do it like this. There are some fundamental differences between uh, the two approaches. Differences that come from a step before. Okay, a step that describes um, uh, describes the, the the goods market. And here I had a nice animation, but it doesn't work. So I will I will just just ask you to to focus a bit on those different points, starting with the first one. Okay. So we once again compare the two approaches, the aggregated supply approach and the Phillips curve approach. The first point uh, that we want to raise here is the importance of an interest rate in the economy in those two approaches. So uh, in, in the approach with the aggregated supply, so the old fashioned approach, the interest rate is endogenous and is a function of money supply and money demand on the, on the financial market. You remember we have this LM curve, which is indeed a curve, is an increasing relation between output and, and the interest rate, because we have an interaction between money supply and money demand. And the interest rate is an output of this interaction. All right. While in the, let's say, new textbook uh, approach, the interest rate is taken as, as exogenous. It's simply determined by the central bank and there is no um, equation that is determining the interest rate in the short run. It's the central bank that is deciding what is the level of interest rate and then adjusting the supply of money to defend this level of interest rate. Therefore, um, it's a way more simplistic approach towards, towards macroeconomics, though I don't claim it is, it is not re unrealistic. It is realistic because, as we know, currently central banks are uh, setting um, monetary policy through uh, determining interest rates. But they, of course, also determine the supply of money, but it's not the exact communication from the central bank that goes to the, to the markets. 
Okay, it's, it's the interest rate that is, that is the important variable. All right, now the second part. Does the ISLM depend on prices P? So in the in our old-fashioned approach, the IS does not depend on the price level in the closed economy. Now think of the open economy. So in the open economy, the IS does uh, does uh, depend on the price level. Okay, but still we are in the in the closed economy, so that we compare those two those two models in the closed economy. So in the closed economy, the answer to the first part of the question is no. So IS is so the goods market is not affected by the price level, but the financial market is affected by the price level through this money demand, um, sorry, so, sorry, real money supply uh, function, um, which, as you remember, is the nominal level of money over the price level. Okay. While in the new textbook approach, the, both answers are negative. So neither um, the the price level affects goods market nor uh, nor the, the financial market. Because the financial market is very simplistic. It's simply the, the horizontal straight LM curve, which is simply keeping the, the, the interest rate in the economy. Now, does the price level affect output in the old-fashioned way of thinking about those uh, uh, this model? Yes, and it affects through two, two channels. One channel is the LM curve, since uh, the, 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 the money supply, the real money supply is, uh, is a function of the price level. On the other side, on the other hand, it also is affected through the aggregated supply function, as we saw in the previous, in the previous equation. Okay? In the new approach, is uh, the price level affecting output? Yes but only through the, the Phillips curve. So now, let's now talk about the, the similarities between those two approaches, because I'm still trying to convince you that those two approaches, the aggregated supply and the Phillips curve, are equivalent. Let's look at the equilibrium conditions in both, uh, in both models. So in the aggregated supply approach, the equilibrium condition is the equivalence of the price level and the expected price level in the economy, while in the Phillips curve is the equivalence of the inflation rates. Then, when it comes to output gap, we know that when output, the current level of output is larger than the natural level of output, as we have it here on the left-hand side, then necessarily the price level is above the expected price level. Okay? And you can you can call this situation overheating of the economy because the output is above the you know the the, the level that should be uh, should be achieved by the economy when the unemployment rate is at the natural level. While in the in the Phillips curve approach, here we have a situation that an uh, an analogous situation that a higher level of output um, is associated is associated with higher level of, of inflation. And then you can show that the dynamic equivalence between two approaches is uh, maintained if and only if you assume that the expected price level is evolving over time according to this equation. That people form expectations uh, by um, taking the old level of prices and multiplying it by the expected inflation rate while the expected inflation rate is simply the, the previous level of inflation rate. If you derive now the, the equilibrium, uh, sorry, the, the, the equation for, um, yeah, the equilibrium condition, this, this, this equilibrium condition, so that you write on the left-hand side P, PT, now remember the indexes, right? It's, it's what, I, what I told you. In the medium run, we should have indexes everywhere. I put it here so that there is no confusion. So if you write on the left-hand side the, the actual price level in time t, on the right-hand side the expected price level in time t, which is this one, then you substitute for with this, and you substitute for the expected inflation, okay, you get this equation. Then if you divide it by pt plus 1, what you will get is that the inflation rate in time t is equal to the inflation rate in time t minus 1, and the inflation rate in t 
minus 1 is simply the expected level of inflation, and it's exactly the equilibrium condition we have here on the right-hand side. So you see a full equivalence, full equivalence between the definition of the equilibrium and those two approaches. The only difference is our assumption about how the interest rate is determined in the economy. In this approach, it is determined by money demand and money supply, sorry, money demand and money supply, so that the interest rate is the equilibrium interest rate on the financial market, while in the PC approach, it's determined by the central bank, all right? And this is the only difference between the two approaches. The rest is totally identical. So now, hopefully, we can efficiently uh, go through from one language, the PC language that you know from previous courses, to the AS language, so that you are reinsured, re you are assured that nothing crazy is happening there. So that all the uh, all the determinants here are almost exactly the same. So now, what about the equilibrium? So in the aggregated, uh, uh, yeah, equilibrium. So now we are. So we here uh, finish the description of the so let's say supply side or the market mar labor market um, labor market equilibrium which is represented by either AS or PC curves, okay? So now let's talk about uh, the goods market and the financial market, okay? So the aggregated demand function, so the aggregated demand function, as you remember from the first, from the first lecture, is a relation that incorporates two of the well-known relations that we have out there from the short run, the IS relation and the LM relation at the same time. So what we are doing here is simply we are expressing our aggregated uh, the goods demand and goods supply equation and the, the money supply and money demand equation, which is uh, represented by this ISLM graph in the in the um, in the space of outputs and interest rate. Okay, so we have the IS curve which represents the first equation, the LM curve over here which represents the second equation. And now what we what we do in order to derive this aggregated demand function is simply we check what are the different short-term equilibria for different levels of prices because we know that for different levels of prices our short-run equilibrium will be changed. Why we know this? Well, we know this because the financial market is affected by the level of prices and this shifts the LM curve. Okay, so the, every change in price is actually a change in the real supply of money, as if there was a, you know, a money contraction or money ex monetary expansion by the central bank, and this affects the, the position of the LM curve. So our uh, demand, uh, aggregated demand curve is simply a relation in which we would like to graphically depict the relation between the equilibrium output and the price level. Okay, is it clear? So we want to uh, be able to, to say what is the evolution of the equilibrium level of output if the price level changes in the economy. And we know how, it's, how it works. What are the changes in output when the price level changes? We know it from the short-term ISLM model, okay? So for every level of prices, we can draw new, new uh, LM curves in all, all the po possible places. And then we map the equilibrium level of output and those price levels, which caused us to change the, the location of the LM curve. And this gives us a downward sloping curve, which represents uh, the aggregated demand. Why the curve is downward sloping? Well, because an increase in prices is effectively a decrease in real supply of money. This is equivalent to increasing, uh, to, to reducing uh, the money which is, which is actually available in the economy for transaction. So the relative supply of money is decreasing, so the price of money goes up. This is what we see here in this graph. So the price of money goes up, the interest rate goes up. This, of course, causes the demand to fall because higher interest rate means lower level of investment, okay? So you see here that 
not only the interest rate goes up here, but output level goes down. Yeah? And therefore, we have a clear-cut relation between prices and output, which is downward sloping. So if you increase prices, you decrease output. All right? And here we have two endogenous variables uh, analyzed. These are the standard endogenous var variables that we have in the short-term ISLM model. But we are uh, analyzing those short-term equilibria for different price levels. But we change those prices in an endogenous way, right? We don't say anything about how the prices are changing. Cool. So now, what about the medium-run equilibrium in this in this aggregated supply, aggregated demand approach. On the one hand, we have the equilibrium on the labor market, represented by the aggregated supply curve, which gives us also a relation between prices and output. On the, uh, on the other hand, we have the relation that gives us, for every price level, the equilibrium level of output, which comes from the fact that we have equilibrium on the goods market and the equilibrium on the financial market. At the same time, the IS and the LM at the same time. This is the AD curve. So we have one upward sloping curve, one downward sloping curve, which means that we have exactly one point that gives us the equilibrium. Now, you will have 10 seconds to answer the question. Try to think about this, about, uh, about the mechanisms, about arguments for yes and for no. Okay. And then I will give you the answer to the question. So the question is, is point A the equilibrium in the medium run? Is point A, that is the crossing between AD and AS, is it the medium run equilibrium? So you have 10 seconds to give an answer you know, in your head, and then we will talk about this. Okay. All right, so the question was whether point A is the medium run equilibrium. And the answer to this question is no, not really. What is the definition of the medium run equilibrium? Well, two alternative defini definitions. One, that the, the actual price level is equal to the expected price level. This is the actual price level. This is the expected price level. Those two are not equivalent in point A. The second definition is that the unemployment rate is equal to the natural level of unemployment. Can we say something about the unemployment rate here at this point? Yes. Why we can say something about this? Because we know what's the level of output. And you remember that unemployment and output are very tightly connected through this um, definition of unemployment rate. Knowing that the actual level of output is greater than the natural level of output, is equivalent to knowing that the unemployment rate in the economy in point A is, is smaller than the natural level of unemployment. Okay, This comes from a very simple comparison of those two equations. Hmm? So we know for sure that A is not a um, medium-run equilibrium. Now, um, is A a short-term equilibrium? Once again, 10 seconds to think about the answer to this question. All right, so once again, is A a short-term equilibrium? The answer to this question is yes, it is a short-term equilibrium. Why? Well, we know that every point that is lying on this AD curve is a short-term equilibrium. Why? Well, this, this comes from, the, from how we derive the AD curve. We derived it as a solution to the ISLM problem for different values of prices. Okay, So we know that each and every point here on this curve is a point in which the IS curve and the LM curve are crossing, and this is definitely the equilibrium on goods market and the financial market. Right? No, the answer to this question is yes. This is the short-term equilibrium, but not necessarily a medium-run equilibrium. Why this is not a medium-run equilibrium? Well, uh, 
Because in the medium run equilibrium, as I mentioned, expected price level has to be equal to the actual price level. All right, this comes from this aggregated supply uh, function. So how can we make an equilibrium out of this uh, situation here? Well, you see that there is an inconsistency in people's expectation about the price level. Because the expected price level, and this is a, an, an important hint that I give you right now, from this graph, you can always see the expected price level in the economy as a crossing between the natural level of output and the AS, AS curve, which is here in point B. So this will be this, this crossing between this vertical line, which comes from the natural level of output, and the AS curve, which is this. Point B will always determine what is the expected level of prices? And you see that those two numbers are not, not equal. So this seems that our individuals that are, uh, that are making decisions in this very simple economy are not rational. People see that prices in, 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 in this time, in time T, are different than what they expected. So what do people do? Well, rational people update their expectations, right? So what people will do is that they will change their uh, expectation level. To what level? Well, to the new level of prices. So what will happen here, let me do some magic with this uh, nice, uh, with this nice what? Okay. All right. Okay. Do I have it? No, I don't have it. Give me a second. Um, hmm. Well, the question is why it's not working right now. Uh, Ah, uh, okay. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right. Ready. So where are we? Um, the expected price level is determined by the, the crossing between the natural level of output and the AS curve. As you can see, the expected price level is not equal to the actual price level. So people are not stupid. They will change their expectations. So the new level of expectations will be equal to the new level of prices in the economy. So people will change their expectations so that the AS curve will shift up somewhere here. Sorry for, for my, my drawing, okay? So this would be the new level of, uh, of expected prices. But what will be the, the actual level of uh, of prices in the economy, well, it will be somewhere here, right? So this would be the new level of prices, which is P, let's say, double prime, okay? Once again, is, is the expected level of prices equal to the actual level of prices? No, okay? So people once again will change their expectations so that the AS curve will once again shift to the left-hand side. And this process will go on and on again, unless in the medium run we achieve the equilibrium level of output, so that the price level here would be both the actual level of prices and the expected level of prices, all right? This level here. And this is how the medium run equilibrium is, is, uh, is actually realizing, all right? In the AS, <coughs> sorry, ADAS uh, model. And this is exactly what you can see here in this graph, so that the AS curve is shifting upwards, so that because people are changing their expectations of prices right according to to the actual situation in the economy and in the medium run in this point a double prime we have two properties fulfilled 
first of all, the actual price level is equal to the expected price level, and this is our definition of the medium run equilibrium. And on the other hand, we have that the output level is equal to the natural level of output, just here. And the same for the unemployment rate. Okay? Unemployment rate is equal to the natural level of unemployment. Now, what's happening in the new textbook model with the PC seeker? Well, the situation is way more primitive than in the previous uh, in, the, in the previous case. Why? Well, because there is no endogenous mechanism in the economy that allows the economy to go to the medium run equilibrium. Why is it so? Because prices do not affect the LM curve, as you can see here. Prices, the price level, does not affect money supply, does not, does not affect the equilibrium on the financial market, and does not affect the interest rate, because the interest rate is exogenously given by the uh, central bank, just like here. So what is happening in a situation then when there is no um, equilibrium in the economy? So we are not in the medium run equilibrium in this, in this graph, but we are in the short term equilibrium because the IS and the LM curve are, uh, are intersecting. So what is the mechanism that, that brings the economy back to the medium run equilibrium? Well, it's simply the change in the interest rate that comes from exogenous decision of the central bank. So in order to be able to, uh, to go to the natural level of output in the medium run, the central bank has to increase interest rates so that the output goes down, the investment goes down, and the interest rate uh, goes up. And we go back to the natural level of output. And you see there is no, no economics behind this. It's simply that as if the central bank was able to control 100% the economy, the interest rate, and, uh, and the output level, even in the medium run which is something which I'm not very comfortable with, because this is exactly what is what the central banks would like to do, but they cannot do due to really many, uh, many different uh, arguments. That is why this simplistic model with the Phillips curve only will not be analyzed in our, uh, in our course, simply because assuming flat LM curve is something that we cannot, um, that we don't observe and we cannot sustain, at least in our, our uh, analysis. But the definition of the equilibrium in this approach is equivalent to what we had before, right? Equiliba uh, equalization of prices and here equalization of the inflation rates, assuming that the expectations are formed in a specific way, that people uh, expect the inflation rate in time t to be equal to the um, to the inflation rate in the previous in the previous uh, in the previous moment of time. All right. Okay. So there uh, there should be a break here. Um, I will continue with the uh, with the with the lecture, but you can have a break uh, here so that you can pause uh, pause the um, uh, the film and have a short break. But we continue on. All right, so all in all, we go back to what is essential here. We treat our medium run economy in a way that we have the labor market equilibrium with the aggregated supply function that gives us the relation between prices and output, and the aggregated demand curve that gives us uh, the relation between prices and output, but they give us the equilibrium on two markets, the goods market and the financial market, all right? And of course, we know that the medium run equilibrium is now dependent on the expectations, on the price level that is expected by, uh, by individuals in the economy. And this is what is going to determine the location of the AS curve, and it's going to determine the equilibrium level of output and the equilibrium level of unemployment, okay? So now a few more details about the aggregated supply, aggregated demand functions. So as we noticed before, the aggregated supply function is a function of expected price level, and it shifts 
with uh, changes on the expected price uh, level. When the expected price level goes up, the AS curve shifts, sh uh, shifts upwards. Okay, and this is something that we used previously in the previous slides, just a couple of minutes before. Then when it comes to the aggregated demand function, here we have a bit more complex shifts. Uh, first of all, first of all, remember what are the endogenous variables now in our free market model. We have free markets, a goods market, a financial market, and the labor market, and we have three endogenous variables here. We have the output level Y, we have the interest rate I, and we have the price level P as three endogenous variables in the model. This means that if all the other variables or parameters of the of the model change, we will have some shifts of the of the curves that describe the medium run economy. One of those parameters is the expected price level, but we know that expected price level is evolving in the medium run over time. So it's not that much an exogenous parameter uh, in the model. We know what is the value of the expected price level in the in the equilibrium it's equal to the actual level of prices. So it's not that much an exogenous variable. There are, however, some exogenous variables in the model that can affect the location of the AD curve. And those ex exogenous variables are very similar to the ones that we analyzed in the ISLM model. This is the nominal supply of money, the governmental expenditures, or, or the taxes. These are the variables that determine the fiscal and monetary policy that we analyzed in the previous in the previous um, previous lectures as well. Of course, all the other variables that affect the location of the IS curve and the location of LM curve will also have an influence on AD curve. Okay, but we refrain from from going uh, that much to those details because we are not interested in those dynamics. What we are interested in is the way that our medium run model will change or will evolve over time when we will when we will make changes to monetary policy and to fiscal policy right so what happens when there is a decrease in nominal money so in the supply of nominal money so if there is a decrease in m you remember that the uh, that the, in, the decrease in m shifts the LM curve to the left hand side okay which means that the output level will be lower and the interest rate will be higher and this is what we see here in the graph as well for the same level of prices here this horizontal long dashed line a decrease in nominal money means a, a lower level of output for the same level of prices, okay? This simply means that the AD curve will shift to the left-hand side when we decrease the supply of money in the economy. On the contrary, when you increase governmental spendings for the same level of prices, you will experience a higher level of output on the, um, uh, in, the in, um, in the short term, okay? So in the ISLM in the ISLM model. This, this is as obvious as we did uh, before. Now it's depicted by the, by the AD curve. So once again, an increase in governmental expenditure, so increase in G, will have positive influence on the location of the AD, so the AD curve will shift to the right-hand side. So for a given level of prices, we will have a larger uh, level of output produced in the economy. Hmm? And now two last slides for today. Is the analysis of uh, of those two uh, policies uh, that you can implement the monetary policy and the fiscal policy in the medium run but in the closed economy all right so that if we get this so if, if you understand this you are almost ready to to write the exam to write down the exam because this is the last difficult part in terms of theory in this course all right. So now let's study what happens in the medium run when there is a monetary expansion. All right. Monetary expansion meaning that we have an increase in the nominal supply uh, of money. From our short-term analysis of the ISLM model, which is here on the bottom of the graph, 
we know that an increase in the nominal supply of money shifts the LM curve to the right hand side. And this gives us an increase in output. All right. And a decrease in the interest rate. So maybe what is important here is that our initial point of the economy is this point A. Okay, so this is the initial uh, intersection of the IS and the initial um, the intersection of the initial IS curve and the initial LM curve that we have out there. And this point A is also represented in this uh, output times price uh, level space, and it's equivalent to this uh, intersection of the AD and the AS curve. Okay, so we start out from this point. Then uh, what we experience is monetary expansion, so an increase in money supply. This shifts, of course, the LM curve to the right-hand side, so that we, we have an increase in output and a decrease in interest rate. Right? But we know that in the medium run, an increase in output is equivalent or is followed by an increase in prices. As we said here, right? So an increase in money supply will shift the AD curve to the right hand side. So for a given level of price, we will have a larger output. So um, an increase in money supply will shift the AD curve to the right hand side. And the shift of the AD curve in the right hand side means an increase in prices, as we see here in the point A prime. Therefore, what our economy experiences in this ISLM diagram here in the bottom is that the LM curve will shift to the right hand side, but not to the point B as it would be if there was no reaction in prices, as it would be in the short run, okay, when prices are constant. It would be a, a bit. Um, so the shift of the LM curve would be, would be less uh, expensive. Uh, then uh, the shift to the point uh, to the level of LM prime only due to the fact that there is an increase in prices that follows an increase in the nominal supply of money. All right. Why there is an increase in prices? Well, because now we have the medium run economy. The prices are now changing, and we know that the prices will change, will increase after an increase in the supply of money. Therefore, once again to be clear. The LM curve is shifting to the level to the to the position of LM prime, not the position of LM double prime, because LM double prime is not internalizing the fact that prices are going up. This would be the case in the in the ISLM model, okay? Without changes in prices, now we have changes in prices, which means that the LM curve is shifting only to the position of LM prime, and our new equilibrium point is A prime. Right? This is the short-term equilibrium, and this is not a medium-run equilibrium, as you can see, because the level of output is above the natural level, and the expected price level, which is this one, is not equal to the actual price level in the economy. Yes, and this is exactly what we have here. So since the output now is larger than the natural level of output, the expectations about prices are too low. So people will adjust their expectations because they see what's happening in the economy. So the price level will be adjusted upwards. And then you know what's happening when we adjust prices. The same this, uh, discussion applies um, as we had it two slides before. When people increase their expectations about prices, this shifts up the AS curve. So the new AS curve will be crossing um, somewhere. Uh, this this point here and we par parallel to the to the previous AS curve okay but this will still not be the medium run equilibrium because the price level will still be different than the expected price level okay but finally what the economy will will experience is a shift of the AS curve to the level in which it crosses the AD prime curve in this point A double prime so just just over here and this is equivalent to the backward shift of the LM curve um, to the initial position, to the position described by the LM uh, curve. 
What does it represent in the medium realm? This is something which is called money, money neutrality. Money is neutral in the medium realm. The supply of money does not matter for, for output, for the, for the equitable level of production. This simply means that, um, let me just try to phrase it in a good way. The nominal levels do not matter for the, for the economy. What matters are the real levels. That is the real supply of money, not the nominal supply of money. Why? Because in the medium run, prices adjust. And you see that this adjustment of prices, which was from this initial level here to the new level here, is almost is exactly equivalent uh, to the adjustment, to the change in the nominal supply of money. All right? So the ratio of M over P, so the real supply of money, did not change. Why we know this? Well, because the initial location of the LM curve is exactly equivalent to the final location of the LM curve. And this location is determined by the real supply of money. So the real supply of money did not change at all after changing the nominal supply of money. This means that the economy is immune to the nominal levels. And this is an argument that, is, that has been raised by monetarists or the Monetary School of Economics, of Macroeconomics, led by uh, the guy named Milton Friedman, famous uh, macroeconomist from the Chicago School, a Nobel Prize winner. They claimed that uh, money, uh, monetary policy is not efficient at all. It is, it is inefficient to, to change the supply of money, to change the interest rates. Why? Because the economy in the medium run is neutral to the level of money. Where they write, well, in the medium run, yes, but we know that a medium run takes some time. What is important, especially for the politicians, is the short run, because the political cycle is rather quite short, huh? four years. You can argue that this is, um, this is uh, already sufficient to have the economy in the medium run, but there is a transition from one equilibrium to the other equilibrium, and this takes time, and this can be kind of uh, awkward for the economy or, or difficult for the economy to, to go through a, through a recession or expansion, right? Which means that uh, it is important to study both the short run and the medium run. But in the medium run, prices do not matter. Sorry, and the nominal values do not matter because prices adjust, right? So this is the monetary expansion. So now, what, is, what would be the monetary expansion in our ISLMPC model, so the new textbook model? Well, it would be super primitive. You can, you can find those, uh, this analysis in the pages of the new uh, version of the textbook. The only thing that you, can, that you can study there is simply readjusting the interest rate. Nothing more than this. There is no endogenous process of changing prices within the ISLMPC model. And this is a big drawback of this simplification they made in the new version of the textbook, because you don't see this dynamics of the, of the economic system. You need to have an intervention of the central bank to change the interest rate, okay, to readjust to the new, uh, to the new, uh, to the output that is, that is uh, greater than the natural level of output, okay? So this is a, a situation to some extent that there is a central planner that is you know um, manually uh, manually manipulating some some variables of the economy and the economy cannot by itself adjust to the equilibrium this is this is a big drawback of this simplification they made in the new version of the textbook and one, one argument for sticking with the old version of the model all right so money neutrality monetary expansion inefficient in the medium run Cool. Last slide for today. What happens now uh, to our medium-run economy if we have a fiscal restriction? So a decrease in budget deficit, which means a decrease in governmental expenditures. Once again, we are starting our analysis from point A, that is the initial equilibrium in the short term, the IS-LM curves, 
are intersecting in point A. And not only it is a short run equilibrium, it is also the medium run equilibrium because output is equal to the natural level of output so that the AD curve is crossing the AS curve and the actual price level is equal to the expected price level. Why you know this? Because the vertical line is crossing the AS curve just here in the point A, right? So the expected price level is exactly equal to the actual price level. Now, from this new equilibrium, what's happening is that the governmental expenditures are going down, and this induces two effects. One in the short term, of course, the IS curve is shifting to the left-hand side, right? So that, well, uh, we have our economy moving from point A to point B. If the prices were constant in the economy, but we know that prices are not constant in the economy in the medium run. We know that the AD curve is also shifting to the left-hand side, right? Because we have lower demand for, uh, for, uh, for goods. But simultaneously, the prices go down. And if the prices go down, the LM curve will shift as well. It will shift to the level to the to the position of LM prime, which is which is just here. So that the new short-term equilibrium is not the point B, as if would it would be if prices were constant. No, prices go down, so that the new short-term equilibrium is this point A prime, which we can see over here. So slightly lower interest rates, slightly higher output. Right? But once again, this is a short-term equilibrium, but it's not a long, uh, sorry, a medium-term equilibrium. Why? Because now uh, the economy is in a recession. So the, the expected price level, which is somewhere here, is too high. People are expecting too high prices in the economy, while the current level of prices is somewhere here. So people will, will readjust their expectations and the expected level of prices will go down. And with this, the AS curve, AS curve will shift down, all right? This will cause prices to decrease even more so that the AS curve will shift, shift, shift until it crosses uh, the AD curve in point, in point A double prime when, on the one hand, the output comes back to the natural level of output, fair enough. The price level is now lower than before, but the interest rate is also lower. So this is a big difference between what we observe in the monetary expansion and here in the fiscal policy. So in the monetary expansion before, let me just go back, both the output level, where is that? Okay, both the output level and the interest rate were identical in the old and the new equilibrium, all right? So the only, level that, only thing that changed in the new equilibrium is the price level. While here, after a fiscal expansion, uh, sorry, fiscal um, re uh, reduction in expenditures, what we see is that the output level is now going back to the equilibrium level of output in the medium run. Okay, so it's the same. The price level is different, but also the interest rate is different. So this is a big difference between those two and the implications of those two, those two policies, right? So what is important here is that, hooray, well, the government should decrease uh, expenditures to save their budgets, to, to, to reduce budget deficits. Why they are not doing this? You see that the medium run model tells you that uh, a decrease in governmental expenditures is actually neutral for the output in the medium run. Of course, but what happens in the short run? And this is what, what the politicians are looking, looking for. In the short run, the economy is moving into recession because output is decreasing, the interest rate is decreasing, okay, prices are decreasing, but this, uh, but this um, decrease in governmental expenditures is putting the economy into a short-run uh, short recession, which is something you, you would like to uh, avoid when you are a prime minister or a policymaker, okay? Therefore, once again, in the medium run, um, Things are a bit more optimistic than in the short run analysis. It's not that um, people don't believe in this in this medium run model. It not, it's not the case. People do believe in this, but they also realize there is a transition dynamics between the initial medium run equilibrium and the final medium run equilibrium. It's not happening instantaneously as it was in the short run equilibrium. Here you see that we have the sequences of short run equilibrium 
that are moving, first of all, the output to the left-hand side, so recession, and then going back to the natural level of output. But this takes time. And in general, uh, people don't, um, authorities don't want to put economies into recession, even in the short term, because it's, it's not good for their votes. All right, so a short uh, summing up. This is the, the core of the medium run model that, that, you should, that you should know, that you should be kind of flexible with, especially when it comes to those policy analysis and those, uh, this shift of those medium term and short term curves. Okay? It will be good if you, if you familiarize with this. And have in mind always the, the economic interpretation of, those, of these dynamics that is described, described just here. Okay. Is there something that I should mention for the end? Well, yes, there is one thing. I also posted uh, on Moodle a chapter from the old textbook that is very uh, well describing those things that I talked about just here in those slides. Okay, so please have a look at this. At this chapter, I'm not sure if all of you have access to the old textbook, old version of the textbook. If not, you have the PDF out there on Moodle. Take your time to familiarize with this. Take your time to understand the equivalence between the old textbook and the new textbook. And take your time to understand what's the difference in terms of the fundamental assumption that we are making about the economy. Who is setting the interest rate? either the central bank or the market, okay? So either the, the central bank is fixing the, the interest rate, this is the new textbook, or the central bank is fixing the money supply, this is the old textbook. All right, so I think we are done for today. Um, to finish up, next week I, I will post a bit longer, um, a bit longer a lecture uh, that... Uh, continues with the with lecture four okay with a more qualitative storytelling uh, uh, story uh, storytelling uh, lecture about the medium run in the open economy we will focus uh, we will focus on um, on the history of exchange rates on pros and cons of different exchange rate regimes optimal currency areas and policy trilemma for open economies but before this we need to know what are the dynamics of, of our system, macroeconomic system in the medium run under fixed and flexible exchange rates, all right? And to know this, well, you have to know the model. Cool. So see you next week, and hopefully you stay safe. Please don't move too much from your, from your homes, from when you, where you live. It's it's really vital for us that, that we are responsible, socially responsible, and that, we, and that we don't spread the disease all over the, pl the place. The situation is dramatic, and I, I'm pretty sure you understand the, the, uh, this situation and you are acting responsibly. I wish you all, uh, all the best of, uh, of health and care. Take care and see you. See you next week.